Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, the kind of casual edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Friday the 17th of May, 2019. Welcome to another program. Obviously, you know that you have duties as a viewer. We want you to like the show. If you find it on Facebook or YouTube, please comment on the YouTube channel to uh, issues you want to discuss. Or if you find a factual error, which sometimes occurs, you're allowed to uh, correct us in the, uh, the comments on YouTube. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and share this episode with your friends. Uh, you can even share it with your enemies. I'm not going to limit this to friendships. Anybody you want to share this with is, is fine with Gavin, George, and I. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we had George on vacation earlier this week. How was the vacation? It rained. It rained. Of course, it's Florida. <laughs> but it looks like you got a little redness. You got some sun there. Oh, it's just skin cancer. We grow them here in Florida like uh, <laughs> like mushrooms in England. Sure. Uh, how you been doing, Gavin? Oh, extremely well. If, if a bit tired, but um, too much driving. I get very bored driving, so I, I listen to audio books and uh, learn some theology and history. That's good. Very good. Um, lots of news. A whole bunch of small stories and some bigger stories. I think we're just going to cover the bigger stories um, this week and save some small stuff for next weekend, Monday. Uh, first off, there's still uh, trouble with covering crosses and how it's relevant and not relevant to witnessing and taking on Islam in the English culture. And I thought we could still speak to that, Gavin. Um, what's the latest? I was at a meeting yesterday, and suddenly across my iPhone flashed a news alert which showed the Bishop of London, Bishop Pett of London, I mm -hmm. think I have to say, uh, dressed in a very fetching purple head covering. And, and she was visiting the mosque in Regent's Park and had covered up to do it. And, and in one sense, this is a, appears to be a, a generous sharing of hospitality between Muslims and Christians. The problem is the traffic is all one way. So it would be nice if the Bishop of London invited Muslim women who were wearing head coverings to feel free in the presence of Christ to uh, remove them when they came into Christian churches. And then you could make some kind of sacrificial point that, that this was an act of generous humility on her behalf. But of course, she makes no such invitation to, to Muslims. And so it mirrors the accommodationist and rather shallow theologically and culturally approach of the church in England. So in Darlington and in Durham, there was a, the, the local mayor asked if social relations could be improved by inviting Muslims into one of the churches and, and the lady vicar thought this was a great idea uh, and plans were made to have the men saying their prayers in the nave of the church and women in a side room but in one of the side rooms there was a very beautiful picture of Jesus knocking at the door of the heart by Holman Hunt mm -hmm. and some crosses and it might have been lovely for the woman vicar to say we love Jesus here's what he promised we'd like to introduce you to Jesus while you say your prayers and um, see if he has anything to say to you. Instead, the woman vicar, uh, following the example of the bishopette of London, covered up the crosses and covered up the picture of Jesus. Uh, the situation was only changed when the archdeacon came in and chose to exercise a canon of the of England which said you couldn't have um, <clears throat> other aspects of worship and therefore the Muslims couldn't come in. Actually, of course, it's not entirely clear whether the Muslims were having an act of worship when they had their prayers to finish Ramadan uh, because there's no direct equivalence again between Muslim <coughs> prayers and Christian liturgy. But it was clear that what the Archdeacon was doing was trying to stop something that had turned out to be embarrassing. Uh, and, and indeed, the diocese did everything it could to keep the thing under wraps so people wouldn't be able to talk about the fact that the Christian church appeared to be ashamed of the cross and ashamed of Jesus. Well, is not the point, well, one second, is not the point of Ramadan for the uh, Islamic people to grow closer to the real God? Well, of course, everything depends on what you mean by the real God. Kevin. Well, That's exactly. I, <laughs> but, yeah, but in I, order I'm just to, going to, back to the, uh, the original the conversation, text. 
yeah. you'd need to be able to talk about Jesus, not mm -hmm. cut him up and hide him. There are alternative explanations here for both of these issues. The first, and we need to consider this carefully, is perhaps Sarah Mullally, the Bishop of London, has now become an Anglo-Catholic and has taken to wearing mantillas, uh, the oh, uh, elaborate head coverings <laughs> that uh, we see in uh, Hispanic countries. It's a possibility. I mean, uh, I, I believe uh, when women meet the Pope, they all have to wear uh, mantillas or coverings. Mm -hmm. Perhaps she has been moved by the Holy Spirit to adopt this uh, Best, you know, symbol of uh, you mean she's been, reading, she's been reading St. Paul and learning about <clears throat> the headship of, of Christ yeah. and the headship of man. And yeah, so, so and on. now, uh, shall, we, shall we completely shut that door or just say that she's a craven politician who has no concept of what theology is and is just going along because she's been told to? And could this incident in Darlington not also be a case of a vicar belatedly coming to understand the whole iconoclasm classic uh, controversy? That we have these statues that people are worshiping and these images that we need to banish from our churches and that Cromwell was right. Could it be that or could we have someone who has no concept of what Jesus, who Jesus is, what he came for and what it's about and they're just seeking to basically be uh, social workers uh, in uh, clergy collars. I now, think uh, uh, our readers have to decide. Uh, what do you think, uh, Kevin? Is that a fair way of saying that well, we have it is fair. I mean, outbreaks uh, of uh, extreme Anglo-Catholicism and extreme Protestantism? We've uh, seen work this in the time, Church of England women's clergy. We've seen this time and time again. Jesus is just there when I need him, and when the uh, Muslims were visiting, they did not need Jesus, and they just covered it up and. Uh, I'd like to, 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 to share a memory with you. Sure. Uh, the Sunday Times phoned me half an hour ago, and I'm not just dropping the name, because they, they were asking about, does the nature of the Muslim prayers in a church make a difference? Would, would they be more welcome if they prayed certain prayers rather than certain other prayers? And that was a really intelligent That's and a good, good question, question, I thought. Yeah. Um, so I shared with him, I wasn't able to answer it, but I did share with him uh, an event where I was part of a Christian pilgrimage that went into a, a local mosque, and we had Palestinian Christians with us. It was uh, in Moscow. Uh, and the Muslims st laid on some special prayers when we went into the mosque. Uh, and, and we thought that was rather sweet of them. When we came out, the Palestinian Christians looked grey and very upset. And because, of course, they understand Arabic. Yes, they do. <laughs> and they said the Muslims had been praying the most violent, deprecatory prayers against us as we came in, that, that profoundly upset and threatened, uh, which I think means the Sunday Times reporter, Nicholas Helen, was right. It rather does depend on what kind of prayers they pray. But as yet, we're not, we don't have many examples of Muslim praying kind, concerned, and hospitable prayers for their Christian neighbors, if only we did. Well, George, here in America, in Philadelphia, last week they videotaped children singing Behead the Jews um, at a nice uh, little Islamic education center. That made the news here because of how, how violent and, and sick it really was. People really don't know what they're saying in Arabic anymore. No, but we shouldn't be surprised because the there are terrorist uh, affiliated, terrorist infiltrated, uh, terrorist promoting uh, Muslim groups. Not all Muslim groups in the United States do this, far from it. Mm -hmm. But the uh, there are a good number where uh, the FBI and the New York police, for instance, used to have undercover programs where they would place people in mosques. And that's how they caught the blind sheikh. Uh, people preaching murder and death and jihad from the pulpit in the Friday prayers in New York City. And of course, this is not in English. It was in uh, Urdu or it's in Arabic, whatever the language of that particular congregation was, or Somali mm -hmm. in uh, Minneapolis. Um, I don't think it's quite this bad anymore, but we reached an nadir where civil liberties activists would say we cannot no, we must not listen to what these people are saying because that's an invasion of their privacy and an invasion of their free speech rights, which include uh, the head slitting the throats of non-believers. I mean, 
this beheading business is, you know, look at how ISIS kills people. Look at that poor French priest. Gavin, you remember this about the priest murdered at the altar about two years ago, was it now, in France, where mm -hmm. uh, jihadists slit his throat. Um, again, we will have the cranks and the crackpots who respond saying, oh, you are saying all Muslims are blatant terrorists. We're not saying that. But we are, what, what we are saying is that there's an institutional bias within uh, the uh, Muslim prayers that are aggressively and offensively anti-Christian and anti-Jewish. Well, the only equivalence we've had in the Christian world, I think, is that the old pre-Vatican II Good Friday prayers about the Jews, which even Benedict, uh, which even Pope Benedict said, we need to basically clarify what we're saying here because they can be taken as being anti-Semitic. Um, there is no equivalent movement within the Muslim world. Keep talking. Uh, Hopefully, you'll come back around. There is no, there is no equivalent in the Muslim world to that movement to reform and renew the liturgy, to reform and renew the public expression of the faith in a multi-faith, uh, multicultural, multi-worldview. Uh, uh, I want to kind of move in to our next topic now because I think most of our uh, English audience is tuning in to find out what we think of the suspension of a bishop from Lincoln. And I thought uh, it'd be something interesting to talk about. It's not the first time there's been controversy over bishops not doing enough when uh, people thought they were required to or the law required <coughs> them to. And I know both of you guys can speak to this, but uh, um, is Justin Welby overreacting again, or is there really uh, smoke and fire here? Well, I don't know what he's doing messing about in Nebraska, but uh, it's right. nonetheless... <laughs> But Gavin, you can you speak and enlighten. Yes. Of course, we don't entirely know because mm -hmm. the exact reasons for Lodson's suspension haven't been published. And that's part of the problem. There hasn't been any due process. There's been a unilateral act by Justin Welby. Lodson is the first diocesan bishop to be suspended in this way. Uh, and he's quite clearly immensely shocked by it. The thing is, as, as George was saying in an earlier conversation, Lowson is one of Welby's friends. He's part of the liberal establishment. He doesn't have many uh, biblical, overtly Christian convictions in terms of the way he runs his diocese. He's a very welcoming and friendly man. Um, but Panorama did an expose into the previous history of Lincoln Diocese, and it was awful. There were some terrible cover-ups, and some of the victims would rightly feel very angry about the way in which the church in the past has done nothing. But the problem with the Church of England's response today is that in the church, it behaved appalling, in the past, it behaved appallingly badly. It still hasn't faced up to its misdemeanors, and the people it failed to hold to account. But in the present, it, it appears to be rather, rather badly overreacting. <coughs> and Lawson is accused of some aspect of turning a blind eye so serious that he has to be immediately suspended without appeal and without process it's very hard to imagine quite what a blind eye a nice warm friendly responsible bureaucratic liberal catholic could have done to merit that and therefore the assumption must be that welby has overreacted and the problem is we that it, it seems rather like george bell um in Lowson's case, there doesn't appear to be any evidence. In Bell's case, the evidence is all in one way. There's just a suspicion that rather like bad middle managers, the people in charge of the Church of England, and Welby in particular, are throwing victims under the bus to avoid responsibility for, for, for other incompetences. And the trouble is, no Church of England bishop will sleep well in their beds tonight. If Lowson can be thrown under the bus for that, anybody will be suspended any time for almost anything. Well, George Bell proves that no bishop who's dead in their grave should sleep well either. Um, <laughs> I what that. I, no, I can, what, what I, the... I'm going to engage in some mind reading now, Kevin. Okay, if you go will. for it. I got and nothing. that uh, my my interpretation of this is that uh, Justin Welby is creating a fire break. If you've got uh, if you've got a, a forest fire and you don't want the fire to spread to your property, 
uh, you uh, set a small fire between your fire and the next fire so that there's no fuel to burn so it jumps over to your place. Uh, Justin Welby's creating a fire break, I think, over the whole Smythe and I were in controversy about his role in cover-ups, about his activities of, of being aware but not acting, of abuse. And so he's making, as with George Bell, he uh, is giving a sacrifice. Christopher Lowe and the Bishop of Lincoln, he's giving a sacrifice. He's creating uh, diversions to prevent this fire from spreading to him. And there are credible accusations that have been raised about Lambeth Palace's handling of abuse, about the Archbishop of York's handling of abuse, about Justin mm -hmm. Welby, what did he know and when did he know it? It's not just George, Kevin, and Gavin raising these things. These have all appeared in the British secular press and are well known, but what we've seen is stonewalling and silence when it's surrounding the top people. And, and here's what's surprising, in other words, when they were throwing Wallace Ben and John uh, John Hines, John Hines mm -hmm. under the bus, these were the rough edges of the House of Bishops. These were the outliers. This was an evangelical and an Anglo-Catholic. They weren't on side. They were expendable. Christopher Lawson is a good soldier. He's a team uh, player. He's a team player, yeah. and they're sacrificing him. Uh, as Gavin says, who is now safe? Well, Justin Welby is safe, but nobody else is. One of the other developments that's taking place is that there are calls for safeguarding in the Church of England to be monitored by agencies like ICSA, in other words, outside external agencies, and also to bring in legislation to make reporting mandatory. Now, one level that sounds uh, perhaps a helpful antidote to the irresponsible incompetences of the Church in the past, but, but bad cases make bad law. The idea that no one ever has any discretion to uh, deal with something themselves or locally uh, is quite alarming. The, 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 the forcible requirement to report or else you yourself are guilty of a criminal offence is very much the behaviour of a totalitarian state rather than responsible organisation training and trusting its people to behave morally and properly. I want to be clear that people know that we are for, for full investigation into this. At no point should the church be involved in any cover-up of sexual scandal within the church at any level. However, this current administration has a history of overreacting. And that's basically what we're talking about here, whether it's George Bell uh, or some of the other characters that um, the Church of England has, has thrown under the bus which we find out, you know, after due diligence and a Carlisle report and all that, these guys are innocent. And the and Church of England, or at least Justin Welby, does not admit they're innocent after they're pretty much proven innocent. This, this reminds me, Kevin, do you remember in the United States we had the McMartin Preschool case? Yes, uh, In the 80s, yeah. and I think it was the 80s and the mm -hmm. 90s, we had this whole flurry of... Uh, ritual satanic abuse cases is taking place at daycare centers and people's lives were destroyed and sentenced to decades in prisons for things that did not happen that were physically impossible to happen that um keep you know it all turned out to be a fraud i'm not saying that abuse didn't occur in daycare centers no, but well, it, it, we saw the medical we had profession. That in the, you had it in England. Well, I mean, this is no, what we, we had, had in the English news. Now there's a guy called Nick, yeah. uh, who turns out to have been a paedophile himself. But he's been feeding the the, the police for the last fifteen years yeah. with stories about Edward Heath um, and several other politicians. A whole raft of politicians were accused and investigated by the police, who acted with extraordinary officiousness, despite the fact there was no evidence because this one person said so. Turns out now he himself is a paedophile and everything he said about uh, this group of people, including Leon Britton, a number of them died while they were under suspicion of being paedophiles. They weren't at all. The whole thing was completely fabricated. But in a climate where you, where you introduce legislation that forces people to act, the moment someone denounces anybody else, 
there is no exercise for any kind of judgment at all. And the fact that people have exercised judgment poorly in the past doesn't mean you remove it altogether. You just go from one extreme to another. My complaint is, given quite rightly what Kevin has said about the absolute imperative of paying attention to victims, that you don't solve the problem by mandating automatic reporting with the pain of, a center of becoming a criminal if you don't. Well, this is Alice in Wonderland. This is off with their heads. You know, the, the sentence before the trial. And um, I have a lot of difficulty that, with that because I was raised in the 80s and watched something we now call false memory syndrome uh, mm -hmm. occur and be investigated. With these children in the, in the California daycares, they finally went back and reviewed the, the tapes of the interviews with these children and were watching the prosecutors lead on the children and causing these false memories. And every psychologist who watched these tapes were appalled. Well, the child didn't remember that. You just imp implanted that memory in them. What are you doing? And it took almost 12, 13, 14 years for these people to be released from prison after a thorough investigation was done about how the prosecutors conducted the case. If Justin Welby is my prosecutor, I don't feel justice is going to be served. Yeah, got to say, uh, Gavin, who was who was the British pop star, uh, late fifties, early sixties pop star? Cliff Richards. Yeah. Cliff Richards. Mm -hmm. I keep wanting to say Keith Richards, and I know it wasn't <laughs> no, no, no. him. Yes, he's the uh, man. <laughs> Cliff Richards, uh, who has in later life has uh, basically made a profession of Christian faith and as sort of a, an example of. Uh, uh, wholesomeness, if you will, in a popular eye. He was falsely accused, and there was a terrible case where the police colluded with the BBC to allow the BBC to photograph the raid on Richard's house and the just walk. for, just for uh, having good film for the news. Now, well, And their argument also was that if you expose someone like Cliff Richards, you stand more chance of getting other victims to 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 report them, um, but as a but it was a Cliff, the first thing Cliff Richard knew about it, of course, was was when it was on the news. But 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 here, what we're looking for is a balance at all times between the interests of different parties. And when organisations panic, they don't serve uh, either victims or truth by by exercising the kind of action that the Church of England is taking on board at the moment. Well, I liken the situation in the Church of England uh, to uh, the faculty of Harvard University. Um, the One of the deans, which are the house masters, Harvard is divided into residential colleges for the undergraduates. I, uh, a black man, an African-American, who's a professor at, one of the, at the Harvard Law School, I think he was the first uh, black man to reach the position of house dean. Um, he, he was defending Harvey Weinstein, who has been accused of sexual misconduct in some very high-profile rape cases. A group of students put together a petition saying, this man, who is a defense lawyer and a professor of criminal law, because he's representing a man who has not yet been convicted, he cannot be around us poor students because we cannot take the chance that his acting as a good lawyer won't uh, damage us as people. And Harvard caved in. Yes, it did. And so, what we the lesson that we've learned is that uh, if you do something really bad, and you you can't even hire a good lawyer anymore, if that lawyer wants to preserve his reputation among the politically correct establishment, and this is how it's uh, though the Harvard case is an extreme example of stupidity and silliness and evil, it's the same worldview, the same mindset that uh, we see uh, unfolding in the institutions like the Church of England. The Church of England is no better, but it's no worse at being part of this wholesale collapse of integrity uh, that we're seeing in what were once great institutions. I want to move on to our final story. And it's either a good news story or a bad news story. I'm gonna hope it's good news. Good news, we're gonna have more provinces in the Anglican Communion. However, it's caused by a breakup of the uh, Middle East and Jerusalem. And I thought, uh, George, you broke the story. What's the story? The uh, province of 
the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem in the Middle East is the province that has four dioceses right now. Iran, Cyprus in the Gulf, uh, Egypt, and Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's right. Good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. It's, it's fine. Well, it was a bit cobbled together because it includes English retirees on the island of Cyprus, mm -hmm. Indian and Sri Lankan evangelicals working in the Arab Gulf states, Egyptian, Egyptian natives in Egypt who are Christians, uh, a handful of uh, Christians in Iran who have not been exiled or murdered. And it's all was cobbled together into one province in 1970, in the early 70s. Well, Egypt, Archbishop Benir Nice, who's, who had been Archbishop, he's now Bishop just of Egypt, has been working very hard for Egypt to be its own diet province. And he's working to di split Egypt into four dioceses, North Africa, Horn of Africa, Gambella, which is Western Ethiopia, and Egypt proper. And at the uh, Synod meeting for the Diocese of Cyprus and the Gulf, Archbishop Michael Lewis said, this is a terrible idea because Egypt wants to go its own way, Jerusalem wants to go its own way, what's that going to leave? It's just going to leave us and the Iranians. And Munir, two weeks later, when he had his synod, said, I want to announce, here's where we are in the plan. The ACC is sending a delegation to come look at the viability. We've talked to people. We're well underway. So the province is going to split. And uh, Cyprus and the Gulf is desperately trying to hold it together, but it's not going to happen. And Cyprus and the Gulf itself is about to fall apart because they just learned that 30% of their income from the parish in Doha uh, in Qatar uh, is now going to be cut because Cyprus is liberal Catholic, uh, the Gulf is conservative evangelical, and they're just sick of basically paying for the English retirees when they could use the money to build the kingdom of God among the uh, expat among the workers in the Gulf states. Now, if people so it's a great paying, story. Yeah, it, for those who don't really understand what was happening, the faithful churches are holding together and growing, and they're sick and tired of holding on to the liberal churches. Have you heard that I'll before? You an, I'll give, yeah, I'll give you an example. The yeah. Anglican church, the, the Anglican church in Doha, raised its money, raised the money from its parishioners. Mm -hmm. Got the uh, local sultan to lease them the le lease the government lease them the land. They built an Anglican center where all the Protestants worship, Pentecostals, uh, everybody, 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 all worship there at different times. When this thing was built, the Qatari government said, "Okay, we're going to give the lease to the bishop rather than to the parish council." The bishop turned around and said, "Okay, you have to pay me rent now." And I'm going to charge rent to all these other Christian groups. So the vast majority of income from this burgeoning, vibrant, dynamic, evangelical Christian group was being shipped off to Cyprus in the Gulf. Cyprus, which is a liberal Catholic area, which is dying, which doesn't have any money to make it ends meet, which imports British retiree clergy and pays them you know, nothing because they can't afford it. And the evangelicals in the Gulf, Oman, Qatar, uh, the UAE, uh, are basically saying, look, we've got the fields are right. We're not going to keep subsidizing a failing institution uh, run by the uh, liberal establishment. Indeed. Now, is this story familiar to people in the Church of England, Gavin? <laughs> well, it is, and I'm, I'm increasingly <coughs> hope that evangelical um, traditional evangelical and, if possible, traditional Catholic parishes might take the same uh, course of action as regards churches that cover up their crosses and say to the diocese, if you're going to promote this kind of ministry, we'd rather send our money to people who are, who are proud of Jesus and want to share Jesus than people who are not proud of him and want to disrespect him. For the people in, in Qatar, the issue comes down to sending money to employ more drones in uh, in cyprus versus spending money to support uh, a, a sri lankan taxi driver who is going to a pentecostal church that meets on our property that needs our help where is the work of christ being done is it in helping non-anglicans is it helping anglicans is it bringing people who don't know jesus to the faith or is the money better spent maintaining an establishment far off that is immaterial to the daily life of this church. Mm. 
I think we've reached the patience of our audience at half an hour. That's not bad for us. You know? uh, got three good stories. I got, Guys, once again, please like the episode, share the episode, comment on YouTube for the episode. Um, we like that very much. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to Anglican Unscripted, episode 504, on the 17th of May, 2019. Thank you. Thank you.